On December 9th, 1968, Kurt Angle would be born to his parents, Jackie and David. Raised in the pleasant suburbs of Mount Lebanon, Pennsylvania, Kurt would be the youngest of six siblings. As younger brothers often do, Kurt strived to be like his older bros. Each of them were involved with sports, and so naturally, Kurt wanted to be an athlete too. In fact, Kurt was so influenced by his brothers and their pursuit of athleticism that at age five, it would become his dream to win an Olympic gold medal. But as a boy, Kurt would stick to roughhousing and wrestling with his brothers until he was old enough to join a team himself. Fast forward to high school where Kurt would set his sights on football and wrestling and suck. Kinda. This might be surprising for those of you who know Angle, but for those of you who don't, let me give you some background. Kurt is regarded as one of the greatest professional wrestlers of all time. He is seen as a legend not only for his talent, but also for how he overcame addiction and loss. In his prime, his strength and technique could only be matched by a few people. And yet at the time, Kurt was considered the worst athlete in his family. According to an interview Kurt had with True Jordy, quote, I was the worst athlete in my family, and that wasn't bad because everybody in my family were good athletes. But I lost a lot when I was younger. I cried a lot. I was a real crybaby. My family doubted if I would ever be good at sports. Kurt was into sports and he had a lot of potential, but his mentality and work ethic meant that he wasn't achieving much compared to his siblings. While everyone else was considered star athletes, Kurt was basically at the bottom of the family tier list. So how did Kurt become the wrestler we know today? Well, unfortunately, Kurt actually points a turnaround due to the loss of his dad. You see, at the age of 16, Kurt would tragically lose his father to a workplace accident. Growing up, Kurt's dad had always supported him by being there for his games, but their connection would end up going much further beyond that, all due to a single sentence that Kurt's dad said. As Kurt describes it, David was something of a functioning alcoholic, basically someone who is constantly drinking, but still manages to be an apt father and member of society all at the same time. He would still go to work, church, and his son's games, but drink through all of it. Kurt says he would have two glasses of rum before bed and another in the morning before work, and mostly only enjoyed going to church since he would get an opportunity to go out and drink afterwards. Because of this, Kurt would rarely get a chance to talk with his father. While the two would speak during car rides and about wrestling matches, outside of that, their communication was few and far between. He wasn't abused or anything, but most conversation was prevented due to the fact that David would almost always be under the influence. And so Kurt's relationship with his father wasn't the closest. That's why it was really crazy when his father chose to elevate him above all of his other brothers. Despite seeming destined for mediocrity, you're gonna be the one is exactly what Kurt's father told him a year before his death. At the time, Kurt didn't understand what he meant. Out of all his siblings, he seemed the least likely to succeed, so why would his dad say this? When his father passed a year later, he thought back to it again. Still puzzled, why would his father choose him? Kurt was the worst athlete in the family. They barely talked. And yet his father had seemingly picked him as the one to pull up the family to a greater level. It was like his father was foretelling that out of all his brothers, he would be the one who took the family legacy the highest. Kurt thought about his father's words for a second time before coming to a single conclusion. The only way that what his father said could be true was if he became the greatest athlete possible. From that day forward, Kurt vowed that he would become a champion. That way he could fulfill what his father had said. Suddenly, he started focusing on sports more than ever, and as a result, his performance would drastically improve. As a sophomore, he would qualify for the state wrestling tournament, placing third during his following junior year. Finally, in his senior year of high school, he would be named Pennsylvania's heavyweight champion. Just like that, his growth as an athlete had become astonishing. He had gone from a self-proclaimed crybaby to someone who dominated his matches, and he didn't forget about his dream of getting a gold Olympic medal either. With that, Kurt would graduate high school and dive headfirst into college athletics. Up against Kurt Angle, the defending champion from Clarion College in Pennsylvania. This was a bit of a filler arc, to be honest. Kurt essentially went to Clarion University, kicked butt in countless wrestling championships, and then graduated. While not too much happened here, it does show that Kurt's transformation in high school was a permanent one. It's after college where Kurt's life gets particularly insane. Because upon graduating in 1993, Kurt wouldn't immediately pursue wrestling. Instead, he would start by pursuing his other love, football, aiming to join his favorite team, the Pittsburgh Steelers. If you're confused about why Kurt went for football over wrestling, my guess was that he was equally passionate about it. It's common for a lot of athletes to pursue different sports during different times of year, and they can often be dedicated to multiple of them. We just don't have as much context for Kurt's relationship with football, because there's probably just always been more of a reason for him to talk about wrestling in interviews, seeing where his career with it would go. That's why, after college, Kurt would try to get into the NFL. However, despite putting in his best effort, he would not be offered a contract for the Steelers. It was with that, that Kurt decided wrestling would become his exclusive pursuit, especially with achieving that fabled Olympic dream. And just like that, he would win a gold medal. Not for the Olympics, but still impressively for the FILA World Wrestling Championship. 
this would become an important step towards attaining his dream. Because his performance at FIWA would get the attention of Dave Schultz, who would recruit Kurt to train with him at the Foxcatcher Center. Now to give some background on Dave Schultz, this guy is an absolute legend. Schultz was a wrestler who was so devoted to his craft that he learned seven different languages just so he could learn as many international techniques as possible. That is some high level dedication. Not only that, but he was a seven time world and Olympic medalist. So if anyone could help Kurt, it would be him. So Kurt started training with him at Foxcatcher, a training facility owned by a man named John DuPont. In regard to the Olympics, Kurt now had two advantages over his opponents. The first one was that because Dave Schultz knew so many techniques, there was plenty for Kurt to learn that he likely couldn't have anywhere else. The second advantage was his self-developed strategy based on training to exhaustion. You see, the really interesting element about Kurt's story is that every time you think he's made it to the top, a new adversity suddenly appears. Like just when you think he's got it all figured out, life throws a new challenge at him and he has to overcome it. This time, it was that Kurt was struggling to win matches in general. I know that might sound weird. You might have thought that after high school, he was just going to become this unstoppable wrestling machine. But what I love about Kurt's journey is that he's not perfect. But he doesn't let his flaws stop him either. So for whatever reason, maybe it was just because he was climbing up the wrestling world and the people he were competing with were getting harder and harder to defeat. You know, some real skill-based matchmaking stuff. But Kurt was generally losing a lot of wrestling matches. In particular, there were some wrestlers who no matter how hard he tried, kept on beating him. So the point where he actually ended up quitting due to continuously losing to them. Kurt stopped contact with the sport altogether, no longer showing up to train, and for a while it might have seemed like he was really throwing in the towel. But this actually ended up being a good thing for Kurt because he ended up devising a whole new strategy. Roughly five months into his break, Kurt knew he wanted to get back into wrestling, but he needed to make sure that if he did, he'd come back with a strategy that got him ahead of the competition, something that would ensure that he would return much harder to win against. And so he developed a new strategy, which was based on training to exhaustion. What that means is that Kurt would perform as many reps as possible in every exercise he did, and only stop when he physically couldn't train anymore. Some of you may know this as training to failure. Kurt was basically trying to build as much endurance as possible. Rather than banking on outstrengthening his opponents, he would instead win by outlasting them through his extended energy. You might think that that doesn't sound very complicated, but the intensity of Kurt's training is really what separates it from your normal routine. He would train for about 8 to 10 hours a day, doing things like hill sprints while carrying a man on his back. According to ESPN.com, Kurt would continue to use this regimen all the way up to the Olympic trials, planning for it to be the biggest factor in how he won. During all of his training, Kurt rarely did anything socially, almost never hanging out with friends and never going to any parties. While he did have a girlfriend that he would spend time with in between training, Kurt's heart ultimately belonged to his dream. Everything seemed to be finally going as it should. But then, Kurt experienced a second tragedy. Six months before the Olympic trials, Kurt went to train like usual. And after some practice, he looked up at a TV and saw breaking news. Dave Schultz, his only coach, had been shot dead by John DuPont. So wait a second. Who is John DuPont? Well, as I briefly mentioned before, he was the owner of Foxcatcher, where Dave and Kurt trained. So why did he do this? Well, according to Kurt, John hadn't been himself for a long time. And you can really see this in the bizarre story that Kurt once recalled during an interview. Even from the day he first met him, Kurt describes John as a little odd. He was quiet and didn't say anything for five minutes. Then he would start boarding out words and sentences. He was always trying to impress everybody. Uh, Editor Lufa here, I just want to mention that you know this guy, he was crazy. I think he was also just really a bad guy. Like, you're going to see later that he pleads for insanity, but it doesn't work. Um, I think he, he was, you know, he had a lot of mental issues, but, you know, don't get me wrong here. This guy was, you know, not like an innocent person either, not just a victim of his mental health. He he was a bad, he was a bad guy. I, I just wanted to clarify that. Oh. Am I, in your, am I in your way? John was definitely a sports enthusiast. There was a reason he provided his family's farm as a place for wrestlers to train. But the way Kurt describes him, he was also trying hard to play the part of some sort of expert who knew the sport when he really didn't. Kurt mentioned that he would say a bunch of basic and cliche stuff about being a good wrestler. The way I picture it, he was probably saying stuff that kind of sounded right, but was really just shallow. Like, you only find your true self when you're at the start of what you end towards when you're finish line. Basically a whole bunch of nothing. And that would be fine if that was his only quirk, but it quickly became apparent that John was unstable. John had told Kurt that he thought he was living inside his mansion walls. He was clearly not well, but Schultz, Kurt, and the other wrestlers tried not to give too much worry about it. 
John wasn't comfortable to work with, but nonetheless a generous patron providing a useful facility. The plan was to train at Foxcatcher until the 1996 Summer Olympics and then leave for good. So that gives you some background on why he might have done what he did to Dave. On January 26th, 1996, Schultz was outside his house working on a car when DuPont arrived at his driveway. According to John DuPont's Wikipedia page, it's possible that at the time he believed Schultz was part of an international conspiracy to end him, as he had put up several security defenses within his mansion. DuPont aimed and fired three times, sadly ending the life of Dave Schultz. After a standoff with law enforcement, John would be arrested. He would then be convicted and, while not deemed insane, still classified as mentally ill and sentenced to 30 years in prison. To be honest, both the aftermath and psychology surrounding this case are quite complicated and outside the scope of this video, but there are plenty of YouTube videos and even a movie I will link for after if you want to know more about this case. For Kurt, this loss was difficult for multiple reasons. Not only had he lost a good friend and mentor, but he would now have to spend the remaining six months before the Olympics without a coach to guide him. Thankfully, Dave had taught Kurt enough to train on his own, and while he was now alone, he pushed through the loss by training himself and focusing on his goal. In spite of experiencing a tragedy that would destroy many other athletes, Kurt managed to overcome the grief and not give up. Fueled by pure will and determination, he would continue to train until it was time for the big day. At last, it was time for the first Olympic trials to begin, and Kurt had made it without anything stopping. Him. And yet, somehow, his circumstances would get even worse. For context, for Kurt to even have a chance to make the Olympic team, he would have to pass a series of qualifiers before he could play for the USA. And as if the tragic loss of Dave wasn't enough, he suffered a brutal neck injury before his first qualifier was even over. In the heat of the moment, Kurt's opponent had thrown him on his head. Kurt said that, quote, Right when I landed, my neck cracked and crunched. I was in excruciating pain. My arms went completely numb. I couldn't feel either arm. At this point, it might seem like Kurt can't catch a break. Every step of his journey towards the medal is met with another difficult trial. But that's what makes his story so awesome and shows what an animal he truly is. Because after only a brief injury break, Kurt returned and just ignored the pain. It was still there, it was probably awful, but Kurt just decided that it didn't matter. Before he took his injury break, Kurt was already down three points, and yet now he had managed to tie up the round. A little unimaginable neck pain later, and he had won. The following day, Kurt met with a doctor to find out just how bad his injury was. Because if it looked anything as bad as it felt, he might be in big trouble. The results of an MRI scan showed that he had broken four vertebrae and had three discs sticking directly into his spinal cord. This did not deter Kurt. Instead, he would take a non-steroidal healing agent, which made the injury a lot more bearable as the pain was now basically numb. This would be the first of five times in his life that Kurt would recover from breaking his neck. Fast forward to the final round and Kurt had now guaranteed himself a silver medal, but that only made the stakes higher because from Kurt's view, his medal might as well be worthless as long as it wasn't the gold he had dreamed of since he was five, a representation of pure accomplishment. Well, after pushing through several trials with a broken freaking neck, Kurt had passed all the qualifiers and was now fighting gold. As he began his gold medal match, Kurt quickly recognized his opponent as Abash Jadidi. Kurt knew who this wrestler was, and worse, he recognized that he was stronger than him. But that was okay. Kurt had prepared for this. Rather than count on strength or luck, Kurt stuck to the strategy he had planned all along. That routine he had created after his hiatus, based on training to failure, would now be more important than ever. As the match begins, Kurt quickly loses a point to Jadidi. He then scores a point of his own, evening out the score. This is where Kurt's training really pays off. Most likely being one of the most conditioned athletes in the world at this point, he manages to hold off long enough to ensure an 8 minute drop, from which the match would end. Exhausted, Kurt waited for the results. However, his odds were looking bad because Jadidi had actually already ran up to the judges table and started celebrating at the sight of his name circled on a paper. As his opponent smiles in accomplishment, Kurt is thinking about the dedication he'll be putting into the next four years of training. It'll take time, work, and trying even harder. Jadidi raises his arm in victory, and the ref pushes it down and raises Kurt's instead. That's right, even though Jadidi saw his name circled on the scorecard, he was mistaken. In reality, the judges had ruled in Kurt's favor. The sheer ecstasy that Angle felt in this moment can be seen in this iconic photo. He was rightfully happy. What can you say about this moment? I've worked for this moment all my life. I can't believe it happened. It's the best feeling I've ever had. I saw you near God. Yes. I saw you kneel. I saw you kneel on the mat and pray. Were you talking to your dad? Oh yeah, my dad's always with me. Uh, Dave Schultz, my uncle Fred, my aunt, my grandmother, they're all together pulling for me, rooting for me up there. And I know 
It came down to that. I knew they were with me. I wasn't sure if I won. This is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I can't believe it. All I wanted to do is win a world championship and an Olympic gold medal. And I did them both. If I died tonight, I'd be the happiest man in the world. <laughs> After a difficult journey, he had finally done it, but his career was only starting, as this Olympic win was a feeling he would continue to chase going into his time with the WWF. They had a different name back then. This is the part of the story where we get into both Kurt's prime and painkiller addiction. Kurt's achievement had garnered him nationwide fame, as news of his victory spread throughout the states. Suddenly, he was going on morning shows and even met with the president. All eyes were on him, including the owner of the now WWE, Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon name. Vince McMahon. McMahon. Including the owner of the now WWE, Vince McMahon. It wouldn't be long before he approached Kurt with a multi-million dollar 10-year contract. And I want you to guess how Kurt responded. Did he A, accept the multi-million dollar contract and immediately enter the legacy that millions know and love today, B, negotiate for a few days, leveraging his newfound fame, or C, instead go on to briefly become a sportscaster before completely blanking out on live television? Yes, of course it's C. Like a proper hero's journey, Kurt had to do some soul searching before eventually finding his place in pro wrestling. Because when he brought the contract to his agent, he told Kurt that he was too good for Vince's offer and proceeded to literally throw it in the trash. Afterwards, a particularly foul visit to a different program called ECW caused Kurt to agree, when the born and raised Christian Catholic Kurt witnessed the wrestler Sandman be crucified. If you want more context on that, and so, Kurt would instead get a job as a sportscaster in Pittsburgh, where he claims he had the worst experience of his life. Basically, on one of Kurt's first broadcasts, he had gotten his script pages mixed up, and so he was relying on the teleprompter to tell him what to say. Everything should have been fine, but of course, the teleprompter completely malfunctioned and went dark. Now, rather than improvise or say anything, Kurt blankly sat for a minute straight. His producer, obviously not wanting any more dead air, started yelling at Kurt to say something. So Kurt decided to direct the audience to baseball highlights, only those highlights were actually on football. Needless to say, Kurt didn't really feel cut out to be a sportscaster, but regardless, he stuck with the job and continued to work with the station for about a year. It wasn't until one night when he was watching WWE that he realized he had made a massive mistake. Kurt didn't catch the show too often, but one night he happened to see a showing featuring a man by the name of Stone Cold Steve Austin. Kurt noticed that Austin wasn't afraid to say anything. He would tell off his boss and even give him the bird. Not only did Kurt like that he had an attitude, but he also had impressive technique, which Kurt appreciated as an athlete. From then on, Kurt was hooked. He loved how the program combined athletic talent with the entertainment of a soap opera. It was extremely engaging, and Kurt realized that he had to get in on it. Problem was, it had been over a year since Kurt got his initial contract, and the deal was now void. So Kurt just decided to show up to tryouts, where he was quickly able to get another deal and sign on. Now officially a part of the same company as Stone Cold, Kurt got to work at a smaller Memphis outlet, where he learned the ropes and did a fair amount of TV over the course of four months. During this on-the-job training, Kurt would only do about one or two TV speeches, which he considered to be horrible. Keep that in mind for later. For Kurt's debut, he went up against Sean Stasiak and was introduced as both the only gold medalist to ever grace a WWF ring and the most celebrated real athlete to enter it as well. You see, while many other wrestlers have complex and in-depth characters, when it came to Kurt, Vince just liked the idea of having a bona fide athlete with the Olympic medal to back it up. So Kurt's theme song and designs were all very patriotic to emphasize that. And as you can see, Kurt was pumped to be there. But after about 20 seconds, the crowd started chanting boring. Unimpressed by his simple aesthetic and straight edge background, they had come to the consensus that he was nothing special. Summer and of course Angle, as we said, was successful. But Kurt didn't let this discourage him. Instead, he responded in the best way a professional wrestler could, by grabbing a microphone and telling the crowd, you do not boo an Olympic gold medalist, before immediately getting kicked in the gut. This was a great move on Kurt because it showed that he was comfortable with interacting with fans whether they liked him or not, which is a very important skill for anyone to have in pro wrestling. After a seven minute tussle, Kurt managed to pin Sean and take the win, to which someone held up a sign that said, angle boring, real question mark athlete. 
It was clear that despite his win, the crowd was still not very impressed. If he wanted their respect, he'd have to do more. One of his next big opportunities would be during his first major promotion. Only having done about seven months of training at Memphis with those last four being on TV, Kurt was shocked when Vince approached him with a new request about doing a big promo. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with professional wrestling, a promo is basically just giving a speech to build up the storyline and hype up future shows. Because Kurt's experience with talking on television hadn't been the most amazing, he was hesitant to take such a big offer. This wasn't just a startup sports network, it was a national phenomenon, one from which failure would no doubt both be seen by his friends and role models. He had only gotten a chance to do those one or two talks back in Memphis, which he considered to be horrible. And yet, Vince was suddenly talking about getting up in front of everyone to give a major speech. Although it was possible that Kurt might have been able to pass on this, he decided instead to push down his inhibitions and give it a try. Before he went up, Vince told him what he would have to say, and it was a lot of information, which Kurt didn't really take in. Maybe he got a little bit distracted thinking about potentially embarrassing himself in front of an entire franchise, but luckily Vince was willing to repeat the story. And as Kurt describes it, he was able to get the promo mostly right, and even better, was good enough at it to convince Vince that Kurt had something special. With that, Vince got started on making Kurt his next big star. In February of 2000, Kurt would quickly become one of the only four wrestlers in history to become a Eurocontinental champion which was someone who took and held both the European and Intercontinental belt at once. He would famously lose both at WrestleMania 2000 on a technicality, meaning he didn't even get pinned. You might think that this was the WWE screwing him over, but really it was done to preserve his credibility. While he had lost his belts, he was still technically a wrestler too good to get pinned. 2002 is where things really start to get crazy, with the infamous slip-up, that still gets memed today. Kurt was supposed to say something about being a man while his opponent was merely a boy, but got a little tongue twisted and, well, it didn't exactly sound right. And Rey Mysterio, I want you to remember one thing. You're a boy in a man's world. And I'm a man who loves to play with boys. What I meant to say is you're a boy and I'm a man and tonight I'm gonna love to manhandle you. <laughs> Moving along, 2002 was also the year that Kurt would be responsible for giving John Cena his first match. That's right, he was actually John Cena's debut opponent. Kurt started off that night with an almost Homelander-like speech while also wearing a wig for some reason, because this is WWE. You can tell by now that he had become quite comfortable with his place there, with a crowd that once called him boring, now hanging onto every word he said. Kurt would lay out an open challenge for anyone who wanted to face him, and out from behind the stage would arise John Cena. But there's gotta be somebody back there that 50 years from now... After a very brief interaction, Cena would simply say, ruthless aggression, before jump scaring Kurt and throwing him off the stage. Kurt would ultimately pin him, maintaining his credibility of being goaded, while Cena got a chance to show off what he was made of. Once again for Kurt, everything seemed to be going right, but all that changed during No Way Out 2003. Now we're about to move into a very dark time in Kurt's life, just a warning that subjects of drug and alcohol abuse will be discussed. So how exactly does Kurt's story go wrong here? He had won his gold medal and was now continuously doing amazing in the WWE. It was like he was at home. Well, it was at that match in 2003 that Kurt got his neck broken for a second time and was prescribed some painkillers, specifically extra strength Vicodin. Now, as you'll recall during the Olympics, while Kurt did get a healing agent for his Olympic matches, he had never used anything quite like Vicodin before. He had no idea what to expect and didn't know what he was getting into. After trying the painkillers, Kurt quickly became enamored and things escalated very quickly. Not only did they mask the pain of his injury, but they gave him an energetic feel. On top of this, while many others may have experienced side effects like nausea, the painkillers agreed with Kurt's body without issue. So it seemed like there was no downside to taking them. Kurt was told to take one pill every four to six hours, and for a period of time that worked for him. On the surface, it seemed like there was nothing wrong with taking them, considering his 
his job and its guaranteed injuries, it just made sense to do so. In fact, painkillers were a common and safe thing for people in the industry to take all the time. The problem is that Kurt started to develop a tolerance, and his original prescription was now no longer enough for him to feel the same effects. This caused him to bump up his intake so he could feel the same high. According to what Kurt has said in multiple interviews, two led to four, and four led to eight, and 8 led to 16. Things started to get out of control. Eventually, it came to the point where Kurt was taking 65 extra strength Vicodin a day. If you do the math, that's over 2,000 pills a month. Because no one prescription could ever meet his tolerance level, he had to visit multiple clinics. His addiction became so strong that he was in contact with at least 12 doctors, as well as an illegal dealer, all to supply his dependency. Before he knew it, painkillers had taken over his life. During this time, he even used a calendar specifically to keep track of who he had to call that day, in order to keep his supply coming. One of the things I find so haunting about Kurt's story is that like just a minute ago, we were just talking about WWE fun, and now it feels like I'm talking about a completely different person. It really goes to show just how fast that the painkillers were able to overwhelm Kurt's psyche. You might have wondered if anyone noticed what Kurt had been up to, and although some company members and friends of Kurt knew a little bit about what was going on, he preferred to keep it to himself, with Vince notably kept in the dark about it. This was an incredibly dangerous and scary time for Kurt. When it came to his wrestling career, he was never easy to pin, but suddenly painkillers had taken a firm and oppressive hold on his life. They were all he could think about, going as far as to affect his marriage. And then the worst thing possible happened. Kurt received a call from his brother who told him that at the age of 40, their older sister had died of a heroin overdose. Kurt was shattered. As if the sudden nature of the loss wasn't enough, he hadn't talked to his sister in almost a year. This was because he had told her that he wouldn't speak to her unless she got clean, a vow of silence that was made to be a motivator. And now without warning, he had lost her, taken too soon by an overdose. Warning his sibling in a hotel room, Kurt glanced at his bottle of Vicodin. A moment later, he had taken 20, all at once. And at this time, I would like to say that if you are struggling with drug or alcohol abuse, you are not alone. Even people like Kurt Angle, a gold medal Olympian, have been where you are. The worst thing you can do is be isolated. So if you're struggling, I just want to ask you to reach out to someone as soon as possible. Whether that be a friend, family member, or a crisis hotline, help is always available. You are not alone. As Kurt went into a deep sleep, he wouldn't wake up until 5 p.m. the next day. During his sleep, the WWE had tried to call him several times about a match he had scheduled with Brock Lesnar. They weren't upset with him, but were rather calling to let him know that he was more than welcome to cancel his match if he wanted to focus on funeral arrangements. After he woke up, Kurt got the message and thought about it. He then decided that taking time off was not the right move. Not only did he feel that his sister would have wanted him to show up to the match, but he also knew that it would have at least been an hour where he could distract himself from his grief an escape from the nightmare that his life had become. Although he was four hours late from when he was supposed to arrive, Kurt still showed up in time for his match to face Brock. To this day, he still considers it to be one of the best matches of his career, but with the show over, the pain of Kurt's loss returned. While I would love to tell you that Kurt quit his addiction soon after this night, his dependency would end up going for several more years. In retrospect, Kurt wishes he would have reached out to one of his friends, but at the time, he didn't want anyone to know, and the suffering he endured from keeping it all in would culminate in his eventual departure from the WWE. Despite Kurt being able to keep his addiction under wraps, enough to stay in the company, his tipping point would finally arrive in 2006, a year he would describe as especially brutal. Keeping his problems a secret, Kurt had become like a volcano. Inside, he contained the stress of his marriage, injuries, and the painkiller addiction all to himself. The pressure grew when he especially began to be overworked, something that he didn't exactly push back on. As Kurt describes it, it was really tough. Usually I would main event the SmackDown episode and go 15 or 20 minutes, and then afterward it was basically usually a tag match or a six-man tag. So you didn't have to put in too much work, but the less bumps I took, the better I was. Unfortunately, I didn't know how to back off. I didn't know how to not go anything but 120% all the time. That's the way I've always been and will always continue to be, so I found myself in a bit of turmoil because I kept on racking up injuries more and more because of my style of wrestling. Even for Kurt, a particularly bad injury happened when Mark Henry smashed him into a table, accidentally breaking his ribs in the process. By this point, Kurt has a lot of reason to leave the WWE, but he still continues to hold on and keep showing up to the ring. However, everything I just mentioned was actually only half of the reason he would ultimately end up leaving. One fateful day, Vince approached Kurt with an unexpected development, a request that he moved to ECW. To give some context, Kurt had already been moved around to different WWE branches far more than he would have liked. He went from SmackDown to Raw back to SmackDown in less than six months. 
and it was really messing with his mental health. He was confused. It was like the company didn't know what to do with him, like he was just a utility made to be moved wherever they needed at the time. And the crescendo of this was Kurt being demoted out of the big leagues. You see, Vince had decided that he wanted to reboot ECW, a brand that the WWE had shut down in 2001, and he wanted Kurt to be the main star. While this might sound like an upgrade, it was most definitely a demotion. As a recently relaunched franchise, the ECW would get far less attention than the WWE which meant Kurt would no doubt be making less money. But someone had to take the responsibility of putting some respect on ECW's name, and Vince decided it should be Kurt. Having become a household name in the wrestling world by now, this would no doubt be a step down. It was such a step down, in fact, that Vince would be multiplying Kurt's paycheck on pay-per-view events, to compensate for the fact his fights would be much less prestigious. ECW was also the brand where Kurt had witnessed that wrestler be crucified on live TV. Here's that context you ordered. Kurt would agree to join, but after a month, resign and quit the WWE altogether. However, this was not the only new development that caused Kurt to leave. According to an interview with Hannibal TV, the bitterness about all of his problems was causing Kurt to have a shakier relationship with Vince. And due to his painkiller addiction causing him to not act like himself, he would become erratic and difficult, specifically through sending unprofessional texts. Messages like, I'm gonna kick the out of you, and when I see you, I'm gonna kick your started to appear more and more in their text conversations. Hilariously, in one of their last meetings, Vince showed one of these texts to Kurt and told him, you wanna kick my, let's go right now. Although it seemed like Vince had taken it pretty well, Kurt was ashamed. Of course, what he was doing was embarrassing, but what made it worse was that he also saw Vince as a father figure, one who he had disappointed. Ultimately, his behavior caused the organization to order him to go to rehab, and he just couldn't do that. Painkillers had taken such a firm grasp on Kurt that he was going to quit on his father figure passion, and job. In his last show before leaving the WWE, Kurt had so many injuries that he could only manage to do a 5 second match against Danny Dorian, where he pinned him before leaving the company for good. So what was Kurt's plan from here? Well, in the same year, Kurt moved from the WWE to a different company called the TNA. Now while the TNA did act as a pivot for Kurt from the WWE, it by no means meant a decline in his performance. Throughout all of the challenges his addiction had created during his time in the WWE, they had rarely hindered his actual wrestling skills, and the TNA was no different. Kurt would actually end up having the majority of his best matches in TNA, becoming the second ever TNA Triple Crown Champion in history. To this day, Kurt considers himself more of a TNA wrestler than WWE due to the decade that he would spend there. The problem is that his drug addiction would only continue to grow. Due to TNA's old school culture and willingness to turn a blind eye, the organization was perfect for an addict. And as a result, Kurt's problem became increasingly obvious, with his behavior becoming harder not to notice. From this point forward, Kurt Angle became the man that some of you may know as Perk Angle. Now, while many people like to meme this era making compilations of how funny they think it was to see Kurt blatantly jacked up, this was a very dangerous time. Apart from having the consistent energy of a berserk man who could feel no pain, Kurt would regularly pull off inhuman stunts such as this moonset somersault. Even for a pro wrestler, it can't be emphasized enough how sketchy stunts like these were. Those four broken vertebrae from the Olympics were still very much a problem too. Simultaneously, Kurt's character and performance would also have noticeable changes, with him not quite acting like he used to. When he entered pro wrestling, he was considered grounded. So much so that, as we know, the crowd even considered him boring. But now, Kurt was acting chaotic, strange, and unruly. It's real. It's damn real. <laughs> yeah! TNA's environment wouldn't just amplify Kurt's painkiller addiction, it would also cause him to take on several more vices. Because amazingly enough, Kurt did manage to get off his original painkillers. A doctor was able to help him transition from Vicodin to MS Cotton, a pill that would help him by stopping withdrawals. The side effect was that it left Kurt petrified with anxiety, specifically that he would break his neck again. Because of this, he got on Xanax, and since a huge amount of people at the TNA drank alcohol, Kurt started to in hopes it would ease his nerves. Kurt had effectively taken one step forward, but unfortunately gone another three steps back, due to the fact that he was not getting the help that he truly needed. What he needed was real support, 
support and rehabilitation from people who cared for him, but his isolation was just causing him to dig a deeper hole. Kurt's new addiction to alcohol caused him to have a series of benders where he would drive from town to town with a 12-pack of beer. In 2007, Kurt would receive a DUI in Pennsylvania, and in 2011, a DUI in DWI would also be issued. Finally, in 2013, a fourth DUI would be the breaking point for Kurt's partner, who responded to his call from jail by telling him that if he didn't get clean, she and the kids would have to separate from him. Fortunately, this is where things finally started to turn around. Kurt took a long look into his own soul and assessed his life. He then gave himself a pep talk that went something like, Okay, this is time. You need to do this, not only for you, but for your family. You're ruining your life, you're ruining your career, you're ruining your reputation. It's time to make a change. In August 2013, Kurt Angle did the right thing and went to rehab. It wasn't easy. He suffered intense withdrawals. At first, he didn't even want to leave his room to talk to other people. But after a few weeks, Kurt was not only clean, but free from the cravings that controlled his life. And ever since then, Kurt has continued to lead an amazing new career. At first, he would continue to wrestle in TNA, only this time no longer dependent on the drugs he had been on for years. It was freedom at last. In 2016, he would leave TNA and make his return to the WWE. The best part was that his relationship with Vince had quickly reformed and it was like nothing had happened. Hey, <laughs> How are you, man? How you doing, man? <laughs> good, good to see you. Hey, good, good to see out. you. Out. And I remember walking in, I had a microphone on, and Vince said, take that off. <laughs> We're talking privately. So uh, I went in the office, and first thing he did was hug me, and he didn't let go. Well, Vince was always a father figure to me. Um, I lost my dad at a young age, and he always gave me direction when I was in this company. The first second I saw him, the first thing he did is put his arms out. He wanted to hug me. Uh, hold on. I haven't seen him in 11 years, so uh, it was good to catch up and to know that uh, he's okay with me, and he, he's proud of me because I've been able to clean myself up and get my life together, so it was, uh, it was, it was good. Everything had gone right back to how it was before that fateful 2003 match. Vince even made Kurt Raw's new general manager in 2017, and both organizations Kurt wrestled for would end up adding him to their respective Hall of Fames. In 2019, Kurt would retire and just recently have a documentary made on his life. When asked about the documentary, Kurt said this, I was told in the recovery center to tell your story, and I've been pretty open about my story and I wanted this documentary to come out to anybody. Anybody that's in trouble, anyone that's dealing with addiction, anybody that's trying to overcome obstacles. It's more about redemption and overcoming. Nowadays, he focuses on hosting the Kurt Angle show and giving back to the wrestling community and trying to wrap his head around how he became such a big meme. Perhaps one of the most admirable things about Kurt was how he went on about sharing his battle with drugs. While many other celebrities would rather seem perfect than share the stories of their own drug abuse, Kurt has been incredibly honest about his journey, acting as an open book for anyone who asks. Kurt himself is a big advocate for seeking out help. His advice is that if you can't talk to anyone about a substance you take, you're probably addicted, and that you should find someone you can talk to as soon as possible, whether that be from an organization or a trusted friend you know can help you. Kurt is a gold medalist who nothing could stop. Time and time again, life threw the nastiest things it could at him, but he kept moving forward. He's not perfect, and he hasn't always made the right decisions, but he is an example of never giving up, even through life's worst adversities. Overall, he is a living legend with a story that I feel honored to tell. Now, something important to note is that because Kurt is naturally the only source for a lot of events in his life, this YouTube video was mostly pieced together from interviews he has done over the years, and he is only human. So it's possible that some details in this video may be contradicted with other accounts. For example, in the WWE clip that I found of Kurt talking about his time as a sportscaster, he said that he guessed golf when he should have said hockey. But in his Joe Rogan interview, he said he guessed football when he should have said baseball. Of course, I'm not calling Kurt a liar. Details like these often get mixed up in memory. And minor stuff like the type of sport that Kurt got wrong doesn't really matter. Just know that I'm going off of what Kurt said himself. I've also seen other YouTube videos that claim different things happened. Like one that said when Kurt wanted to join the WWF, he didn't have to go to tryouts, but rather went straight back to meet up with Vince. Just know that this is a video based on how Kurt himself has explained his life. And his interviews and website are most of my main sources, all of which will be linked below if you want to see where I got my facts. If you're still here, I want to thank you for watching. This video took so long to make, but it's because I got sick and Christmas and New Year's. All of it kind of came together to slow me down. If you're still around from the Lethal Company video, huge shout out to you. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit like. I'm Lufa.